This podcast is part of the Pod Syndicate family. For more criminally compelling shows, articles, and conversations, head to wearepodsyndicate.com. Two men journey to the bars and restaurants of Scandinavia to find amazing beers, always with the same question. Hey, what's on tap? It's time to find out. All right. The final episode of the year. The ultimate episode. It's the end of a decade. It is the end of the... Well, end of a decade, but uh, not for us. We've only been around for four years. Or three and a half years at this point, I guess. Um, But... It's the uh, end of this year. We're, uh, I guess, wiping the book, starting over. Um, Clean slate. We have, uh, it's been 97 episodes this year. Yeah. That's crazy. That is crazy. Uh, I can't believe we've done so many episodes this year. And I've been in most. Um, I would say like 95% of them you've been in. <laughs> Probably. Very few that you were not in. I mean, even looking back, I think it was only mostly the beer festival episodes that you weren't in. But yes. you were pretty much in everything else this year. Yes. And I will say it's been a great year, man. We yeah, had some we, incredible we, beers. We did good stuff. And some great experiences. And uh, I've just had a great time podcasting with you this year. Me too. I'm glad. Me I'm, too. I'm glad we, you feel like you still want to be a part of this process. We shared a lot of good beers. Uh, even though I, I did my festival madness mm-hmm. for a lot of the festivals, uh, I did get to join in on one. We'll you get, did. We'll get to festivals later. But yes. for one festival, I, I did get to do the What's on Tap podcast thing. Yeah. Where we t- try to schmooze up brewers and uh, yeah. So this year we went to um, McKellar Beer Celebration. Yes. We went to Brewskival, uh Great Swedish Beer Festival. Yes. And then uh, we did the All In um, Beer, Beer Festival. And that's where you joined your very first yes beer festival as a podcaster. And how was that? How did that feel different? Than- that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I think All In Beer Festival was one of the best festivals to do that. I think so too. I think as your entry into it, because it's... We it's, tried basically everything they had for the two sessions we were there. Yeah. Um, we tried all the important stuff. Yeah, but it wasn't a huge festival. But more so than that, it was so chill. Mm-hmm. We actually managed to get to speak to, uh, to brewers. Well, I mean, that's usually not a problem when it comes to beer festivals. It's, it's usually not hard to... To sit down and talk to a beer to a, a brewer for a couple of minutes, um, but that one in particular, it wasn't like the problem with Brewskival and NBCC is that they're just so big, yeah, and they're just packed out. Exactly, and because All In is more regional for Yotaboy or, or Gothenburg, um, there's not as many people that are traveling up to it, and because it's so late in the year, um, I think a lot of people just are kind of like. I'm beer festival out. Yeah. I couldn't do another beer festival. I had to. No, um, but I would say this year was was really good. I mean, they had some crazy good brewers there. Definitely. Um, and uh, apart from those festivals, mm-hmm. I also went to Malmo Beer and Whiskey Festival and Hoppapalooza. Yeah, I missed those this year. Yeah. Um, so that that was the festival mm-hmm. run of the year. Next year, we have to look forward to an addition with the Mikeller Wild Ale Celebration. Yeah, I know. We're planning on doing that in February, so that'll be, that'll be fun and interesting. That'll be fun, yeah. Looking forward to that. That should be interesting. The, the lineup looks pretty impressive, and yeah. I'm really glad to see that uh, this kind of feels like the festival that is missing from this part of, uh, part of the world. Yes, I agree. There are like Belgian sour beer festivals, but not really one that's this close to us. Yeah, no, I can only think of one in, I don't think it's in Brussels, maybe it's outside of Brussels. That's a spontaneous fermentation festival. It's kind of how they're they're billing it. Um, and it looks amazing. I'd love to go to it. I think it's in June, May or June, something like that. It looks really, really impressive. Yeah. So all of these festivals this year, I think it's a record for me in terms of number of festivals. Yeah. And on each of these festivals, I, I, including all in beer festival, I managed to try a lot of beers because I hang out with 
people that enjoy ticking and enjoy mm-hmm. exploring new breweries and beers. So I did, I did get to sample a unhealthy amount of beers. You season. did. You sampled a lot of stuff. Yes. <laughs> I was quite impressed with your uh, MBCC. Uh, it was more than 600 samples at MBCC. Yeah, it was intense. That was, that was intense, yeah. Um, I don't know what you did for Mamo Beer and Whiskey Festival, but I also feel like it was quite a lot of beers. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, let's say, 100. It was, Still, it was that's, the crazy. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, because sure. we tried, we sampled, I think it was maybe 60 beers. Yeah. At all in, and that was two sessions. Yeah. So and there was only like, yeah, one event that happened all day at Nama Beer and Whiskey Festival. So that's a lot of stuff you tried. Right. That's true. Yeah. That might. No, nah, it was two days. I know. Oh yeah, because you went the night before. You went the Friday yeah. and the Saturday. Yes. Yeah. But festivals, yeah, they, they, we're getting more and more festivals. That's good. And they're they're getting the quality's getting better and better. Yes. Yeah. By far. Definitely. All right. Well, we picked two beers we wanted to share today because it wouldn't be a uh, what's on tap episode. There weren't at least a couple of beers to review. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about the beers we brought because there's two beers we wanted to share with each other, and also kind of you know look back at the year that was and talk about what we want to do in the upcoming year. So, what what beer did you bring that you wanted to share with me today? So I know that there are a few beer styles that you mm-hmm. particularly love. I do. One of them. Is the beer style we have in front of us, which mm-hmm. is an Oud Brun. Yes. Like a sour Flemish red ale of sorts. Mm-hmm. And I've tried earlier this year, I think even, to treat you to Oud Brun, and I failed. It was a, like a, it was a bad Oud Brun. Yeah, it was. It, yeah. It, it didn't hit any of your notes, and I went from that particular uh, podcast mm-hmm. episode uh, feeling downtrodden. Like, mm-hmm. oh man, I failed. So since then, I've been trying to find a both a rare and a hyped and a cool Udbrun. Mm-hmm. So this one is from Freem, Freem Family Brewers in the US. I mm-hmm. do not know which state because I I forgot. I, I, They're I, from Oregon. Oregon, yes. And whenever I talk to brewers, not mm-hmm. beer nerds, but brewers, and ask them, so what's the most hyped thing you know? And they were like, Freem Family Brewers. What? And they, they, <laughs> I'd never heard of them. Yeah. Uh, so for me, these are new experience this year, new right. acquaintance. And, and it's really unusual to see an American brewer pull out an Oud Brun, Yes. But they also do a Flemish Red. And yeah. they do another like really like hardcore Belgian style. Because I was at Kiosk. And they have all three of these in bottles. Yes, but not this particular one. D- did they have it? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. I was like, oh, yeah. So I almost got the Flemish Red as well because I'm a huge Flemish Red lover. But I yeah. love Oud Brun as well. And this one, I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil the surprise. On Untapped, it has an average rating of 4.28. That's huge. Which is pretty high for a... A weird style. It's like, first of all, for an Oud Brun, that's unheard of. Yes. That is enormous. It comes in at 8.7% ABV, which is a little on the high side, because usually Oud Bruns, I think, come in around 4 to 5%, maybe yeah, 6 I think so. I so think it's so. a little on the higher side. But I love this. It's a, a barrel-aged Oud Brun, uh, has aromas of Marionberry and Cabernet, Ooh. with notes of raspberry, fig, sherry, and leather. A tart finish that will make any beer lover tip their hat. So this was aged for uh, barrel aged for two years. That it, I mean it it uh, it hits the. There's a lot of notes there, and the smell is. Mmm. You get the like the cherry and. Um, a little bit of tartness on the nose. Oh, it smells so good, man. I am super, super excited about this beer. So, uh, this one only has 44 ratings in the world. Oh, wow. If it had more, yeah, it would be the highest rated Oud Brun in the entire world. Wow. So, this is a very high... Uh, 
because Marvelous because beer. the highest rated Udbrun is Avery's Ud Fluris, which has a four point nineteen, oh, and wow. we're on a, at a four point twenty eight. But with a little fewer ratings comes yeah. more homers, people yeah, that yeah, live yeah. next to the brewery, and they're gonna give it five. Yes, yeah. so, I mean even the fact that you could find this at a uh, kiosk is kind of amazing. Yes, because it's should not be that easily available, and it. So the aroma has some of the, the it's like sweet and sour. Mm-hmm. It's like nail varnish, nail polish remover. A little bit, yeah. Yeah? But it's supposed to. That's like yeah, the, the, that's, that's one of the staple of the style. Exactly. Uh, a just, little bit of fruit, like cherry. I get a lot of cherry on it. Yeah. I get quite a bit. Of, not like, like fresh cherry. It smells like it's going to be very fresh. I can't wait to get it. I'm yeah. so excited about this. I have already decided that if you are disappointed, I will not be as sad as I was last time I treated you to an Udbrun. I've already oh, decided that. This is, but I, I, I don't think I'm going to be disappointed I at all. I want you to love it. Well, cheers, man. Cheers, man. It's really good. I also like the style. Mm-hmm. Uh, the chest de Bourgogne was my introduction to this style. Okay. It's much sweeter. Yeah. And this, there's a lot of cherries in the aftertaste. Yeah. Uh, this, the acidity of the nail polish remover comes as a, an immediate hit to the mouth, and then that kind of disappears. Yeah, it's not... Like, so I've had some Udbruns that are quite intense. Mm-hmm. And I would say this falls much more on the mild side. It's of this. kind of mellow, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty mellow. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised this is rated, we say it was 4. Point, 4.28 average. 4.28 average, that is extremely high. But now that I realize that it was only 44 ratings, yeah, th- that's but still, that's I mean, the home crowd. It is the home crowd, and it is, it is the fans that are drinking this. But still, it's not... It's as intense as I was expecting. No. Because I've had a lot of good burns and I kind of really like that intensity on them. Yeah. Um, and this is this is really nice. It's really good. Um, but it doesn't have that like little bit of punch. No, I, I get I get <laughs> it. I get it. Where where the actual Flemish variants mm-hmm. they go much harder on the yeah. vinegar. Yeah, I think that's what I'm kinda of missing is more of the vinegar yeah. that I kind of like from this style. This is very clean, I think. Um, it's got a really nice cherry aftertaste to it. Mm-hmm. Um, a bit of, like so it describes as Cabernet-esque, and I would say, yeah. I almost get kind like of chocolate. Yeah, I think that's where the Cabernet part comes into yeah. it. Because uh, it kind of borders on the slightly bitter chocolate side of things. Um, almost like a 70% chocolate kind yeah sure uh for sure and um i think it's very nice beer uh, overall I, I quite like it i'm happy i am too thank you for sharing this with me for an end of year remembrance this is my chance to to right a small wrong well from an anytime early time you want to bring an oud brun i am not going to say no i know because i always enjoy this. that and the flemish red i'm always gonna be like Yes, I will definitely have some of that. Yeah. But looking back at the uh, at the many episodes we released this year, there were a lot of really amazing beers. Mm-hmm. But we had some stinkers. We did. I, I kept trying for a while to to treat you to Swedish not so well heard of stuff like yeah. Lena Bruck. Well there was the uh, Emma Boda Astronaut uh, and the uh, Uppsala Slumberjack. Yeah. And the Slumberjack was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good. But the Astronaut was like, oof. Yeah, that, that was good. Uh, the Maria Torgitz uh, Leng, Lengkok. <laughs> I like say, hearing you say Longkok. Longkok. Yeah. It was good. Because um, you were so into them at the beginning of the year. You were all over Maria Torgitz. Yes. I think you've since mellowed a little bit. This is the year where Maria Torget went from being a uh, like kitchen brewer to mass produced brewer yeah. and they lost they didn't they didn't all make the of, translation. They, they lost all of their magic in that yeah. process. Unfortunately. I mean we did do the Emmerdalen, uh Glossen and La Seren. Yeah the Glossen was terrible. Right. But the La Seren was quite good. Yeah but that was that wasn't Yammerdalen. That was uh, De La Seren. 
Nope, those are both Yammerdalen beers. Oh, we had, really? We had two Yammerdalen beers back to back. Huh. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. Because the La Serin was uh, the Cuvée de, de Bois. Yes. And that was really good. Yes. Yeah. But we did have another Yammerdalen beer that we actually yeah. liked. Uh, we did the Lennebrook. Oh, yeah, because that was part of the beer calendar. It was the Yammerdalen. Maybe. It was. What? Yep. Yeah, it, it probably it was. was. It was day 13 or 14, yeah. I think. Or yeah, you're 16 right. Or 17, something like that. The Lennebrook, there were two sours, like cherry and uh, I don't know, strawberries. How long in, in Chosbo? Yeah, so yeah, raspberry and, raspberry and, and, raspberry cherry. and the cherry. The cherry I remember being good, but the raspberry I remember being quite disappointed in. Yeah, I, I remember us saying, please continue making this, but please improve it slightly. Yeah, because yeah. that was one of the things where... The raspberry was just like, you want it to be raspberry because you yeah. know what a good raspberry beer tastes like. Yes. And Whereas it, cherry can have a lot of varieties and flavors based on are you using the pits and the skins, are you using the fruit, you know, because then yeah. you can get different. And they basically scratched there. the surface of what a good beer could be. Mm -hmm. They weren't bad in any way, but they were just, no, they were not reaching that level. Exactly. And that's the thing when, when we re re reviewed small scale Swedish brewers. We don't want, we don't want to bash them enough that they quit making beer. Well I don't so, think so, I, 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 as much as, as much power as we have, I don't think we have that level of power. Of course we are the king makers yeah. of Sweden. Of course. Of course. So what were some what were some do you like I'm trying to think of like I mean Wizard Brewing, we did Sky's the Limit yeah, and that's fine. Bats and those both of those are really good. Um we had the Akia Brigus Pralin. Yeah, that, that was, was quite nice. surprisingly yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, I am such a big Drifontainen fan, so me actually getting to bring a Drifontainen Armand and Gaston vintage to share with you, I, I really enjoyed nice. that a lot. Yeah, that was really great. I always loved those beers. Yeah. But we had never, and you had, you and Matthias, you had drank Drifontainen beers, mm. but not you and I. Right, and I love Joy Fontaine. That's one of my favorite um, breweries that exist. Exactly. Um, they just do the most amazing um, lambics and goods, and hands down, just one of my favorite breweries in the world. Yes, but my my What's On Tap podcast.com highlight of the year was treating you and Matthias to the game of beers. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And this one of those, like, I love doing game of beers. I always want to do it more. I think we only did it like one time this year. Yes, that's that's a shame. We I were know. we were talking to some brewers that we wanted to do game of beers with, and then planning those events. It's hard to get everyone together because yeah, you gotta plan it pretty far out to get people uh, everyone involved. Yes, and um, but but this game of beers was the first one where I was the, the host. host, and especially yeah. I was the sole host. And that was a lot of fun getting to trick you, both you and Matthias with uh, the Vestmale double, where yeah. one of you thought it was a red ale and the other one said something like uh, wheat beer. Yeah, that was that <laughs> was a lot of fun. I remember doing the uh, Founders Backwood Bastard and the Amager uh, Patrizio, the Pursuits of Peacemaker, because they were both. Barrel aged yeah, you uh, love old them. ales. You and love bourbon old ale. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, Beckwith Bastards, one of my favorite beers. Mm -hmm. Like, hands down great. And then you tried the Patrizio, and it was it was still really good. Yeah. But for some reason, whatever that Founders does makes it just a little bit better. I totally oh, agree. That was so much. That was so good. All right. Then, then there, there's also stuff that's happened in the beer world during this year. Mm -hmm. Um. Remember, remind me, when were Ballast Point bought out by a big beer? So That was like a year, two years no, ago. that was like three years ago. Ballast Point was bought by Constellation Brewery. Oh, okay. And then um, Constellation, of course, owns like uh, a lot of Mexican brands. Yes. Uh, that are really, really popular. And right after they bought Ballast Point for $1 billion. $1 billion. Which is like ridiculous amount of money. Um, they immediately, almost like within like two or three months afterwards, bought heavily into uh, cannabis production. Uh -huh. and so, so they kind of left Ballast Point well, behind. Them. Right. So they didn't really know what to do with Ballast Point because it didn't really fit within their their corporate their uh, marijuana 
portfolio. Well, I mean, within all of their other beer structures, yeah. you know, they really weren't ready to take on a, a craft beer brand and really take it into a, the next level like you do. You see with some of the Japanese brands, or even with like the AB InBev stuff, like yep. what they're doing. So they sold to this unknown brewery, Kings and Convicts, yes, out of uh, Chicago. And apparently, there's six other backers total. It's a total of six backers that did that. And the estimated amount. Do you know what the estimated amount? They I, bought it for? I recently read an article. Yeah. Where if a couple of uh, investment bankers mm-hmm. have analyzed the situation and they guess. Hundred million. Hundred million. Yeah, that's a nine hundred million dollar write down for yeah. Constellation Brewery. Woof. Right. But you know what? In the long run, it was probably better for them because that's a total tax credit in many ways. Probably so they're not going to take that much of a hit no. uh, when it comes to it. And it's kind of a win win for both because it gives um, Ballast Point um people that really want to they care about the brand and want to grow it out. Yes. And it lets Constellation off the hook for destroying a well-loved brand. <laughs> yeah. Ha- have we talked about the destruction of Ballast Point on this podcast? Uh yeah, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, okay. So so I have said the fact that uh, Constellation when they bought Ballast Point dumped 1400 barrels of barrel aging beers. Yes. That's such an enormous... Yeah. This is like someone's dreams you're dumping. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. That's still that's still crazy. That's. It, it, it might have happened three years ago, but it feels like it all happened this year because there was a lot of talk about uh, breweries selling out and uh, like Magic Rock sold out and uh, Beaver Town might have been this year. Or last no, year. Beaver Town, I can't remember now. Uh, like New Belgium was brought by Kieran. All oh, right. Um, b- 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 uh, well, Kona was bought. Founders by, that we just mentioned with the Backwards Bastard. Yeah, yeah. Founders They've, was bought. Yeah. Um, this year. Um, I'm trying to think who else was bought out this year. Um, so so Beaver Town to Heineken was actually last year. It was yeah, 2018. Yeah, yeah. Was Magic Rock sold this year? Or was it sold? As far as I know. Really? I didn't realize they were sold off. Uh, maybe I'm uh, bullshitting. I mean, that's possible. I didn't realize they had been purchased. Uh, but that's... Yeah, yeah. March. They sold out to a huge Australian company. Okay. Who did they sell to? What do you mean? What was the Australian company that bought them? Lion. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lion's pretty big. But Lion's not Australian, is it? Australian company Lion okay. was a seven-figure deal. Wow. So I did not realize Magic Rocket sold out. No. Holy crap. Um, so that's kind of big. I mean, and then yeah. you saw... Um, who was it? Uh, Samuel Adams bought... Who did Samuel Adams buy? Samuel Adams, do you remember? No. That was a big sell. Allagash sold. Oh, right. Oof. Yeah. Who did, uh, man, who was it that, um, who did Samuel Adams buy? Dogfish Head. Oh, man, that was but, a big deal. But that there have been no negative consequences of that purchase yet. Right, right. And I don't think there will be, because it's, because, I mean, even as big as Samuel Adams is, it's almost like the Craft Brewers Alliance. Yes. It's like a craft brewery buying a craft brewery. So it's 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 actually the reverse of Ballast Point. Yes. Where Ballast Point should be buying this no-name brewery in Chicago. Yes. Instead of a no-name brewery in Chicago buying Ballast Point. It's kind of the, the flip side of that. Exactly. And uh, Samuel Adams and Dogfish Head are far away from each other. It's like northeast... Of U.S. versus California. Well, that Duckfish Head was in Duckfish Head is California, right? Uh, no, I'm. Well, really... Samuel Adams is 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 uh, Boston. She... Yeah, which is northeast. Right. Yeah. 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 I hope Duckfish Head is California. I'm okay. Pretty sure it is. They, they are far enough from each other that they will probably benefit greatly from each other's uh, distribution channels. Yeah. To just. 
pump out. So uh, I, I genuinely love Dogfish Head beers. I Sa- do too. Samuel Adams. But yeah, some of them are amazing. Some of them are just bland. But they've got they, they've done good stuff for craft beer, so they have a place. You know, I think I think Samuel Adams has existed for a long time, and they've been able to grow in a particular way that really uh, uh, benefits them. And I think while I'm never excited about Samuel Adams, they still do stuff like Utopias, yeah, which is exciting. So there is potential there. And when I think back to like my nascent years in craft brewery, <laughs> it was Samuel Adams putting yeah. out like their cherry wheat beer and Definitely. doing their winter seasonal beers and their summer seasonal beers and things <laughs> like that. So, I mean, they they you know definitely left their footprint in the um, in the beer world. I remember chasing uh, new Samuel Adams beers. Twenty fifteen was when Constellation bought Ballast Point. Which seventeen? Yeah, twenty twenty fifteen. Fifteen. Whoa! I know it was longer than I remember too. Yeah. And then Lagunitas uh, sold to Heineken. Completely sold to Heineken AB that same year, or so Heineken that year. That's kind of crazy. So Boston Beer is the second largest craft beer in the country in the U.S. Dogfish Head was the 13th largest. Ugh. That's a really good synergy right there. That's a good yes. purchase for them. So let me ask you, before we approach the next beer, mm-hmm. outside of podcasting, what was your best, biggest beer memory of this year? Oof. <clears throat> I have no idea. Okay, then I'll... So you have something in mind. Then I'll tell yourself. you right, mine. I'll tell you yours. Uh, I've been drinking beer with a small tasting group, mm-hmm. uh, and for one of those uh, nights, we we said let's bring a lot of really crazy stuff, mm-hmm. and we all tried to bring the craziest stuff. And uh, one guy in this group, Leonard, he brought a 1999 Drifontein and Udgas yeah. and the 1999 Cantillongas. That wasn't the best that, the thing though. But we drank them. They were amazing. They were mm-hmm. really cool. And we were talking about these old beers. Mm-hmm. And he mentions that he had a beer that had has been my white whale mm-hmm. for, I think, 12 years. Yeah. It's the Drifontaine 1998 50th Anniversary Super Extra Special Mega. It, that's, it's not called that. It's the yeah. 50th Anniversary, 1998. And he mentions that he owns it. And I go... Okay, so how can we make this happen? What if I bring all the old stuff from my cellar? Mm-hmm. And he goes, I'll bring it anyway. It'll be fun. So if I bring my 1990s stuff. Everyone goes crazy. And that's the, it's the best beer I ever had. Wow. That's a pretty great story. I have zero stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had any kind of over-the-top crazy beer experiences this year. But it doesn't have to be. It can be but even it can be just a regular beer that is just a perfect time. I wish I could say I had something on top of my head. Ah, okay. But I'm totally drawing a blank. I think my best beer experience this year was actually all in beer festival. We had uh, a lot of fun. Because it was just the most just relaxed, just I mean, the problem with, like, Brewskivol and um, NBCC is it's so intense. And you're just trying to, like, you're trying to try things because you're like, I'm never going to get this exposure to stuff ever again. And you're still trying to do interview people and you kind of get caught up in the excitement pretty easily. But what I liked about All In was even when it was at its busiest, it was still, like, really relaxed and just still pretty easy to get to the things you want and you weren't worried about something selling out immediately no. because there weren't enough people there to like drink it all if they even if they're everybody went to the same line at the same time um so i would say overall the best beer ex- beer experience i had this year was uh was definitely all in beer festival but i agree um, i I, en- I enjoyed it a lot as well I would say my best beer connection I've had this year was um, I've actually become friends with uh, Arena from Secret Sisters. Yes. 
and she has been just absolutely wonderful to talk with um, over the last um, half of this year. So we, I didn't really know her before um, we did uh, uh, a Q&A with um, the Great Swedish Beer Festival leading up to uh, the Great Swedish Beer Festival event. So they would have these one, once a month they would do a, a night and uh, we, Matias and I went and we did one of the nights. We did a Q and A. Yep. Unfortunately, we lost her interview because the soundboard oh, no. guy didn't. And it was a great interview. The soundboard guy just didn't record it. So I'm dying to get her back on the show to actually talk about stuff. And uh, since then, I, like I just keep running into her in different places, and we just end up sitting and talking for like an hour and just like hanging out. And it's been really great uh, just getting to know her and. I've, met her family and her kids and it's just been a really great uh, that's really experience. interesting yeah. because for me she's also one of the new beer acquaintances of this year where i knew about her before yeah. but then like one me me her and bjorn from bjorn guiden mm -hmm. we just sat and drank a lot of beer one night yeah and then slightly a recent a while after that she messages me saying hey i'm having a tasting do you know anyone who has old nerd brewing bottles? Yeah. And we're just like, hello. Uh, <laughs> you have asked the perfect person. Yes. I, I I have a bigger seller than nerd brewing themselves. Yeah. So she got some bottles from me to, to have a lot tasting. She's she's really she's she makes good beer. She's she has good smart She's, she's great. God, she's wicked smart, too. Yes. It's intimidatingly smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like math and music and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. But she was really great. And then I got to meet uh, Marlon Derringer, who's a uh, right. Cicero. Yes. And I've, uh, we met first at the... I think we met before the um, Finn uh, Brewery... Uh, Bonanza. Bonanza, which was a fun event. Was it called a Bonanza? Maybe, Maybe not. I don't remember. Yeah. Could be. Finn and um, Friends. Finn and Friends. Right, right. Finn and Friends. That was a, a really nice day. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like a huge collection of breweries, but it was really nice. But we, we, we talked a little bit there, and then, you know, we sat down and had a really good conversation at the um, Great Swedish Beer Festival, and she's just been wonderful to, like, sit and talk with, and, you know, I feel like I've, you know, found a, a beer friend in, yeah. in there and that, and uh, I look forward to future conversations with her and hopefully having her on the show again uh, in, in some point next year. Um, so I feel like this year has been a really good year for kind of growing our beer community and uh, you know, talking with new people and bringing new people into the podcast. And uh, Definitely. Uh, it's been a lot of fun that way. Yeah, we had uh, Pontus, friend of the podcast. He was exactly. in, I think, two episodes. Yeah, yeah. We did a couple episodes. Uh, he brought some good stuff to the table that we drank and enjoyed. I'll we'll have to have him back on the show again next year at some point. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah. Now that he's all healed up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of beer memories, have I told the podcast listeners the story about my ancient beer in uh, in London? I've told you. I have no idea. Very possible. I'll, I'll tell it shortly. I'll tell it. Let's, oh, f let's, let's first have a commercial break. Oh, let's do a commercial break. And then we'll... Because uh, we haven't done one of those in a long time. Because no. we do it all of December because... The episodes are so short. We'll take a short commercial break. We'll come back and then we'll get into our next beer and hear your story. Yes. You like the 1980s, don't you? Of course you do. We all do. But have you ever wondered why that decade was the way it was? Have you ever wished there was somewhere you could go to get past the usual day glow sentimentality? To try and understand 1980s pop culture in a more social, political, and historical context? Because if so, it sounds to me like you're ready to go beyond the aesthetics, beyond the nostalgia. Welcome to Beyond the Neon. Beyond the Neon. Beyond the Neon is the podcast that dares to pull over the Testarossa, eject the Wham cassette, and take off the Wayfarers. If you're looking for retro reviews of Back to the Future, The Goonies, or John Hughes movies, you will you not, not find, find that here. here. If you're looking for top 10 lists of A-Team episodes, Nintendo games, or Stranger Things references, you will, you will not, not find, find that, that here. here. If you're looking for long, boring introductions, Squarespace ads, or Patreon begging, you, you will, will not, not find, find that, that here. here. Because Beyond the Neon, we do things a little differently. Beyond the Neon. 
In each documentary style episode, I look at one area of 1980s popular culture and break it right down. And each episode features academic insight, guest contributions and interviews, as well as clips plumbed from the depths of the 1980s cultural void. Well, YouTube, mainly YouTube. To help illustrate the wonderful, perplexing, terrifying, joyous and utterly thrilling world of 1980s pop culture. Beyond the Neon might not be as regular as other 1980s podcasts, but that's because Beyond the Neon isn't like other 1980s podcasts. Subscribe to the show today and check out all past episodes by visiting beyondtheneon.co.uk. The Mulberry Boys, every Friday night, on the show you better know they keep it tight. ETL is back and the J-Strom's in the zone, introduce the co-host, he doesn't do it alone. Is about to hold court You know he's on the headset You can hear him snort Pop culture movies TV shows and games Rotten Tomatoes Reviews news and Blu-rays Foggy don't play around He will bust a drop fast Welcome to the Entertainment Landfill Podcast The Jason and Steven Show It's the Jason and Steven Show What? The Jason and Steven Show It's the Jason and Steven Show Okay, so we're back, and the beer we have in front of us is a beer that I wanted to share with you. I've had this for a little bit, and um, it's it's from the brewery, yeah. and that's why I wanted to share this. I know how much you love brewery beers. I do. And this was been a little... At the time I got it, it was only available at one beer shop, but I think Ooh. since... Since then, it's come out at a couple of other beer shops. Uh-huh. Um, but it's a it's a collab between uh, Fontenal. Frontal. Frontal. I'm sorry. The the, the they it's might, so they, small. Are I they can't Dutch? Read the, uh, I, I don't believe remember. they and, are. Uh, keep talking. Keep talking. Don't read. Keep talking. Yeah. And it's um, it's a Mexican imperial stout Ooh. between uh, Frontal and the brewery. And I know anytime I see them with a brewery, I'm like, well, I've got to get that because it's going to yes. be fun to share with friends. And I've picked up like quite like three or four bottles of brewery stuff recently that I can't wait to share with people. But I mean, it's a, yeah. it's 750 milliliters and brewery beers you don't fuck around with because I mean, this one's 13%. And a lot of times you get 750 milliliters for 13%. So those not things you just kind of like, we're just going to enjoy this one bottle tonight it's usually Agreed. like you need to share it with a group of at least four or five so people. frontal are dutch i thought so and now yeah. i remember that they put out a few beers where i went whoa i don't know if that's politically politically correct like rhodesian barrel aging rhodesia is uh, the dutch uh, colonization name of parts of africa yeah. I was like, oh, don't go there. <laughs> but they've, they've made some fun stuff, and they've been at, I think, NBCC. Mm. And we've, this, let, we've let this get a little bit warmer, which I right. think is this really good. This has been good. open for about uh, 30 minutes, I guess, at this point. Yeah. So it's got some, it's had time to breathe. I'm getting some uh, licorice notes yep. and some uh, sweetness off of the nose. It smells like a barley wine almost. It does kind of smell like a barley wine. Uh, and the, the color is just pure black. Although it doesn't have... It looks a little, I think the mouthful is going to be pretty thin because it doesn't look, and when you when you agitate it, it doesn't have that oiliness that you no. get from a lot of pastry styles. It's uh, more like a very year. dark barley wine. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And it's kind of, based on the smell and everything, that's kind of what I'm expecting. Let's so, cheers. Cheers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of cocoa. Yeah, there is. I don't, super, super rich dark chocolate uh, thing. I don't know what makes this Mexican. I probably need cinnamon. To go on. No, not cinnamon. It, it's like um, a Mexican okay. cocoa shake. So it's got vanilla, cocoa nibs, and chipotle peppers. Ah. Unfiltered and contains gluten. In case you're gluten intolerant. And it was bottled on. July 22nd, yeah. 2019. It's best before July 22nd, 2024. 
I don't know. Although I'd say if you waited until probably 2024, there would, yeah. no be, there would be zero flavor in this beer left. <laughs> uh, maybe. I really like it. I do too. But we, we didn't give any rating to the Freem Udbrun. Do we need to? Uh, maybe not. I don't think so. I kind of feel like these are just beers we want to share with each other. Okay. We can talk about how much we enjoy them or don't enjoy them. But uh, I don't know if we need to give these beers ratings. You're right. Right. I enjoy that. It's at the time of year. This is the time, yes. to, time to reflect. Yes. Um... Speaking of reflecting, now all yes. the listeners, they've been waiting like crazy oh, story. Yes. for Let's my story. story. I'll keep it short. Okay. Uh, early this year, I went on a f- uh, number of business trips to London. Yes. And I tried to drink my way through London. You did a good job of doing that. I, I did my best. There is a series of, uh, like a chain of craft beer stores called mm-hmm. Mother Kelly's. Yes. And they have different uh, specializations. One mm-hmm. is the best at uh, uh, hoppy draft beers etc so i went to the easternmost one and it turned out that that was the bottle shop so i went into the bottle that shop. one's in the uh bethel green area right uh, no it's it's uh hackney that it's, one's further north yeah uh, northeast yeah it's close to uh, verdant and pressure drops tapping. exactly yeah so i went into their back room uh, bottle thingy and i found yeah there, there's some good uh, hoppy beers and some good stouts and I see one shelf mm-hmm. where there's ancient dusty bottles mm-hmm. so I start looking at them and I find an Eldridge Pope Coronation Ale from 1977 and the, the shelf has a 14 pound sticker on it mm-hmm. so I think it, this, this old barley wine cannot possibly cost 14 pounds mm-hmm. it has to it's a mistake so I went out and I asked, is that a mistake? And she, uh, the, the, the bartender goes, no, no, no. Well, you can definitely buy it. Uh, <laughs> so I go in, I take it, I, I take it to the, to the cash register. Mm-hmm. She punches it, punches it in and she gives me the bottle with the cap on. And I go, uh, uh, can, we op- can you open it? And she's so shocked. She goes, what? You, you're going to drink it? <laughs> well, yes. It costs 14 pounds. That's... For, for, in Swedish numbers, that's so cheap. And she's so shocked because the people who buy these ancient beers, they buy them for like 40, 50 year presents for their friends. They're, yeah. So we open it. It's kind of dusty, but it's absolutely drinkable. So, to, to, for Swedish equipment, it's 173 crowns. Yeah, I just, do, when I did the math there, I just calculated 1 to 10. So, I f- yeah. thought that it cost 140. 140, 173, yeah. that's it, it not that much different. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. That's... For a beer from 77. Right. Uh, from a brewery that no longer exists. Exactly. And their, um, their I almost said predecessor, their... Um, Antecessor. The, the people who come after them. Oh. Uh, yeah, antecessor. Uh, who makes Thomas Hardy sale. Right. They are also now out of business. So Is Thomas the, Hardy out of business? They, they sold to someone else. Someone, oh, someone, yeah, yeah, someone yeah. else makes Thomas Hardy sale. Because it's, it's made by... Um, oh, the name of the brewery eludes me. You'll think about it. But I shared this 1977 beer with the bartender because there was no one else there. I was the only one there. So we're sharing this beer... And her mind is kind of blown because she's she knows a lot about contemporary beer, but trying one of these like gimmicky ancient bottles has yeah. never occurred to her. Yeah. Uh, and then she she says, "Well, you could buy any of these bottles." And I look around, and what I thought was decoration was full beer bottles <laughs> on the shelves everywhere. But on closer inspection, there were like lagers from the 70s and 80s. Ooh, no. And I know that those would have not held up. No. I managed to pick the best held up beer in the shop. I'm, I'm certain of it. So, Thomas Hardy, or Eldridge and Co. Is Eldridge Pope. Eldridge yeah. Pope became Thomas Hardy, which became Mean Time. Oh, right. Which became S.A.B. Miller. Bleh. But the Thomas Hardy Ale is still a really good beer. Yes. And ages beautifully. Yes. It's 
because it uh, okay so that uh, I'll tell you about that there was one experience I had this year where I went to uh, to a friend of ours house yeah. we had the only time I've ever been to one of their bottle shares and um, they went to their cellar and they brought out like uh, 10 15 year old Thomas Hardy L and it was Sub- unbelievable sublime it was because I mean Thomas Hardy like fresh is like it's okay yeah. it's just like it's okay but like yeah you give it 10, 15, 20 years and you're kind of like holy crap this is a whole other experience yeah so so <laughs> that, that might have been the 2005 because those were sold in Sweden very possible very and, and very back possible then, I gave one of my 2005 bottles of Thomas Hardy's ale to an American friend who was going back to drink beer with his American... They, they probably didn't get it. <laughs> what do you mean? Do they, under, did they get it or did they understand? Oh, like, yeah. Oh, oh they, okay. Yeah, he, he wanted to bring it because he, he had given them English barley wines before mm-hmm. and it had blown their minds. And they're, they're used to drinking amazing American craft beer mm-hmm. from the best brewers in the world. Yeah. Uh, they recently drank it. Five out of five across the board. Yeah. I think that's what I gave it to. Uh, it was a five out of five. <laughs> it was like, holy crap, this is the most amazing thing. But giving away one of those bottles, that's giving away a relic. It is. That is a very hard to find beer. Don't have many Thomas Hardys left. Yeah. I mean, because even if you had bought like 10 back in those yeah. days, I mean. They'll be gone. Yeah. You drink a few over the years, here or there, and you think, well, whatever, I'll have a couple more, and... You know, yeah. pretty soon you only have one or two left, and you're not like, really expecting it to, to last. No. Um, but so giving away that relic and it being appreciated in another in a no. beer, beer tasting group halfway across the world, that's that's fun. It's really I, good. I, I like that. Yeah. So that's that's also part of remembering for me. Yeah. It's not just the beers I had; it's the beers I shared. That's the most important part. And that's why, like, I keep buying beers, but I'm kind of like, like, the really common stuff, I don't mind drinking alone, but it's those special beers that I'm kind of like, I just want to save and share with other people. And I find that I keep buying too many of those. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Like, I've got a whole, like, shelf of stuff. I'm just, like, just waiting to share with other people and to have people over to do do shares with. Yeah, Um, I'm the same. Yeah. I'm definitely the same. Mm. But it's such a good feeling bringing out one of those special bottles and everyone in the company knows that it's special. Yeah. And then uh, hype factors into everyone's ratings. But everyone just loving something that you've held on to for a long time. Yeah. Makes it worth it. It does. Really does. <laughs> um, and my bill's beer, beer cellar is not nearly as old as, as yours is. I think it, in most minds, uh, probably five years old at this point. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. To be fair, this year I kind of blew my wad when it comes to old 1990s lambics and stuff. Yeah, you went kind of crazy this year. In with... order to, to <laughs> get at... Uh, Leonard's old lambics <laughs> to impress him enough to get him to share his. It's like if I show you mine. Well, you know, if I show you mine, will you show me yours? That's kind of the point. I mean, you hold on to a, you hold on for a point, and then when you get to that moment where you're kind of like lay your cards on the table because you're going to have an amazing experience. I mean, that's really yes. what it's what it's all about. Yes. And I drank a lot of five out of fives this year. Yeah. Remember you telling me you had the uh, Blue Bear first year that it was released with Leonard? Yeah, the 2005 Cantillon Blue Bar. That was fun. That one had a bottle run of about 40 bottles. Yeah. That's crazy. Crazy beers. If you drink enough beers with enough crazy people, crazy stuff will... Come come to the surface. will, ...will be put in front of you. You just need to... To keep an open mind and to keep
keep being friendly and good company and yeah. bring bring good beers. They don't have to be ancient. Just going yeah. over to Copenhagen and visiting kiosk or Himmeriget or stuff, you can you can come back. Still have money on your uh, bank account, yeah. But some amazing beers. Copenhagen, yeah. Copenhagen's selection of beers to go has exploded in the last yeah. two years. Between McKellar, Himmeriet, and Kiosk, yeah. I mean, it is a virtual pantheon of beers from around the world, from some of the most impressive, amazing breweries you've never heard of. Yes, that are doing just crazy great stuff. Um, a cornucopia, a it, plethora. It both of those things. Yes. And then if you, you combine that with some of the beer shops like Beer Dome or oh, yeah. um, Glass Bonken or uh, what's the other one? There's um, Etre Gourmet. I, I love like Etre that. Gourmet. Yeah. I mean, you're getting, you can really just find the best of Europe and some of the best of America in places you don't expect. Exactly. So it, it might actually be this year that I was introduced to what used to be called Systemizer.se, which mm-hmm. is now called Beerizer. Yes. Um, which is a site for comparing web shops and system blogget, sorting by rating, filtering out what you've already had, etc. That has really helped me locate these amazing gems yeah. in a lot of web shops. Yeah. So if you live in if you live in the Scandinavian Europe. marketplace or Europe. I think mostly Scandinavian though. Yeah. Because it has direct ties to Norway, uh, Norway's yeah, uh, v- monopoly. V- v- monopoly yeah. And the Swedish monopoly. Yes. Uh, so you can tell where its focus is. But it's got something like 12 different web shops in there. I would say they're up to 30 now. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you, need to, you need to dive deeper into this. Apparently I need, to, I need to look a little deeper than what I've been what I'm looking at. Because uh, there's 12 that they feature, 12 to 15 that they feature, I think. Yeah. And then there's a whole subset, apparently, that I'm completely missing. I didn't even, wasn't even aware of. But you can connect your untapped account to it. Yes. And then you can see what beers you've already had, what your friends have rated on the on the shop. And then, uh, yeah, what, um, you know, what web shops are available to you to be able to shop from. Uh, I was wrong. You were right. There's 17. Okay, 17. I was like, 30 seems extreme. But yes. I remember, it feels like it was 12 to 15. But the number of unique beers available on these web shops mm-hmm. is 8,869. Yeah. What? So, Beerizer does not sponsor us. No, they, do, they I, don't. I would gladly, uh, highly recommend that if you're a beer fan in the Scandinavian marketplace... Check out Beerizer. It is amazing. Yes. And you're going to be able to get lots of great, um, find a lot of amazing beers online through there. So the highest rated thing available at the European web shop has an average of 4.64. And what's it's, that? It's a mead from Shrams. It's yeah. the Madeline Third Birthday. There's it, a lot of Shrams just came into the marketplace yeah, in the past week. It costs a fortune, but boom. How much was it? 500? 500? Yeah. <laughs> 500 Swedish, which is about $50 a bottle or 50 euros a bottle. Yeah. But Schrams makes some amazing stuff. Yeah. And they've been making stuff for a long time. We just haven't had a chance to even be able to buy it. Yeah. In and now that it's in the market, it's going to cost you. But to be fair, though, it costs a lot in the U.S. as well. Yes. So it's not like it's cheap in the U.S. and there's just a huge markup. No, no. It's expensive no matter where you go. Yes. All right. So let's, um, let's bring this to a close. Uh, I want to keep talking to you. We could, we could keep talking. I don't uh, want this year to end. But you know, what? actually, actually, I do. Beer wise, and what's on tap podcast wise, this has been a great year. But it, it has been a tough year, uh, all in all. Uh, it's been a reconstructive year. Yeah, it's there's been a lot of changes personally. Yes, um, across the board for for you <laughs> and for me, and we won't get into that now. No. Um, but you know what? I will say. Uh, I'm really glad that you've joined the podcast, yeah. and uh, I consider you one of my closest friends. Yeah, I, I, the same thing. And um, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do next year. Um, hopefully, there'll be more more interviews, more game of beers, more one off events that we can we can check out and, and do. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to me to too what we have coming up. 
But to the listeners, we can say that if you're going through hardships or tough times, you can always rely on what's on tabpodcast.com to fill your ear holes yes. with sweet, sweet love. Once a week, we'll be there for you. Yeah. Rain or shine. Yes. Good or bad. We'll always be there with the, with the beer review. In between those episodes, those weekly episodes, you can always go back to our archive, our history, our, our heritage. Almost 300 episodes worth of, <laughs> yeah. of, that's, of that, heritage there. That's a lot. We're up. We've done a lot of episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, 49 episodes just in December alone. Yep. That's ridiculous. All right. Well, you can find us online at whatsontappodcast.com, Instagram, Facebook, Spotify. We are Pod Syndicate. YouTube. Er, YouTube. Absolutely not Twitter. Not Twitter at all. Blah. Blah. Gross. <laughs> so dirty for even saying that. Yes. Um, so until next time, until next year, keep drinking, you dumb dumbs. podcast is part of the Pod Syndicate Valley. For more criminally compelling shows, articles, and conversations, head to wearepodsyndicate.com.